Today I'm going to talk about a little bit of a sensitive subject to some folks. I'm going to talk about Israel, the nations, and the church. So let's get started. On October 7th, early in the morning in Israel, we have seen on the news uh, October 7th, 2023, that the uh, border wall between Gaza and Israel was breached by the Palestinians, by Hamas, by terrorists. And as these uh, hundreds of uh, terrorists infiltrated into uh, Israel and began to kill people and kidnap people, this was all being done underneath a barrage of rockets, thousands of rockets that were being sent um, in the air from Gaza into Israel. And uh, they were attempting to hit cities and to kill as many people as possible in the land of Israel. So the Lord uh, took me to Israel uh, about eight years ago. And he told me when I went that there were three things I needed to know. He said, you're going there to weep. He said, the tears of my saints have purchasing power. And he said, I want you to pray for the land. So I went there and I was faithful to do what he sent me there to do. I was there for two weeks and I didn't take any tours. I didn't go on a vacation. I didn't go with anyone. I went by myself. I rented an apartment that was a little over a hundred yards from the Jaffa Gate. And I just walked the streets of Jerusalem, the old city and the new city, day and night, just weeping and, and praying and crying out to God. And at times it was very overwhelming. Um, the, the, the burden of the Lord upon me, but also sometimes it was very overwhelming being in a city where the primary language is not English and I do not speak Hebrew or Arabic. Um, there were evenings that uh, one evening I found myself uh, lost in the old city and actually ended up in the Muslim quarters and was almost stoned. Uh, I came across two Arabs uh, who identified that I was not Arab or Israeli uh, and the one grabbed a stone and all I could do was uh, say the name of Jesus. And I don't know what happened, but the man who held the stone just came to a standstill and dropped the stone and he just stood there and I just uh, made a 180 and a quick escape. So eight years ago, the Lord sent me to Israel on a mission and he said, I'm sending you there to weep. He said, the tears of my saints have purchasing power and I want you to pray for the land. So what God was sending me there to do ultimately was to reconcile the land. God does not want the earth to just burn up and fade away. I know that in 1 Peter it talks about at the end of time that the heavens and the earth will uh, pass away, that they will be burned up with fire. But that word pass away actually means a refiner's fire. So it's just like when they put impure gold into uh, the fire, it's only to separate the gold from the impurities so that they can then uh, remove the impurities and have uh, a higher quality of gold. The same thing is going to happen with the heavens and the earth. They're going to be put in a refiner's fire at the end of time and everything that is impure is going to be separated from what is pure and it's gonna leave a reconciled earth. And I believe that this will be uh, what we will call the new heavens and the new earth. So ultimately, that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna to talk about reconciling the earth unto God, um, but this has a lot to do with Israel. It has a lot to do with the nations of the earth, and it has a lot to do with the church. Let me read Isaiah 60, if I can, real quick, just the first three verses of this chapter. It begins by saying, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Verse 3, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So let me go back and just break this down a little bit. So the word of the Holy Spirit that came to Isaiah and is now being presented as relevant scripture to this generation. 
all scripture is for edifying. All scripture is for teaching us and leading us and guiding us. So this was not just for the time of Isaiah. It was not just the time for the early church. But more than ever, this scripture applies to this generation in which we live. So the Holy Spirit begins by speaking to Jeremiah and saying, Look, I need you to warn the people of God and tell them to arise. Tell them to come to their place that I have made for them. So the scripture says that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. From that place is where our authority has to come from. It's where our viewpoint has to come from. So a lot of people um, are listening to prophets and what prophets are saying in the last days and whatnot. I, I purposely avoid what any prophetic voices are speaking, primarily because I don't want it to interfere with anything that the Lord is speaking to me. The best way to hear God's voice is to be in this place of authority as your identity, to know that I am a sinner saved by grace, yes, but now I am a blood-washed and bought, spirit-filled child of God, and I have access to the throne of God, the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God allows me to come near, and I have a seat with Him in heavenly places. So I may not be physically sitting in that seat, but we're not talking about physical things. We're talking about spiritual authority. We're talking about spiritual um, positioning. And God has placed us in high places in these last days. He has seated us next to Christ. And we've got to begin to believe that we're not just sinners saved by grace, that we're not just barely making it through, that our struggles are greater than the grace of God, than the faith that He imparts to us. We can't think that our sins are greater than the blood in His name. He has made a place for us next to Him, and as we worship Him, we can come up to that place and we can fulfill this commandment in this first word in Isaiah 60, Arise. It is time that the church shook off its sinful nature, its carnal nature, and come in to believe that you are a new creation. The Holy Spirit is within you and he has the power to raise Jesus from the dead and he has the power to show you that you are seated in heavenly places. So we've got to get to this place. This has to happen. So he says, once you arise, then you will shine. That word shine in the Hebrew actually means you will become light. So when you are seated in heavenly places, you are in the presence of God. This is your place of authority. You are near him. You are next to him. And God, who is light, will begin to transform you into his image, transform you into who he is. He is light. And as you get near him and you get revelation of him, you are becoming light. So as you arise, you will become light. How is this possible? Because your light has come. That word come means to come in, to enter in. God has come. Jesus, the word of God, put on flesh and came into this earth. The light has come into the earth. And the result of that is that we are able to be seated in heavenly places and become light just as God is light. He is the father of lights, which means we are the children of lights growing up into the image of his son. Because your light has come in, and as a result, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So glory is the manifest, weighty, authoritative presence of God that rests upon His people when they arise and take their seat next to Him in heavenly places, and when they become light. Now the glory, the authority of God can rest upon the people of God. Friend, this is a promise that God has given us. It's not just a commandment. If you'll do this, I will do this. God is saying, this is the invitation. I'm calling you to this. I have paid the way. I have bought you a ticket. I've made you a reservation. Come into it because I want you to become light. And I want my authoritative presence of glory to rest upon you. And this glory that will rest upon you is the glory of the Lord. The word Lord there is Yehovah or Yahweh, and it is the Hebrew word for the Holy Spirit. So when we got born again, 
the Holy Spirit took up residence within us, lives within us. Now we have everything that we need between the Word of God, Jesus Christ, the covenant that the Father made with Jesus, the blood that was shed from His body, and the Spirit that has been given in our confession of faith with our mouth and believing in our heart. We have everything that we need to arise and shine and for the glory of the Holy Spirit to rise upon us. Now, this word risen, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. That word risen actually means to break out. So just as Jesus broke in to the earth, the word became flesh and dwelt among us as the Holy Spirit is within us and the glory of God begins to rest upon us as we are being transformed into sons and daughters of light. The glory of the Lord is about to break out upon us or break out from us, which means the earth is going to be filled with the glory of God. And the way that it happens is it begins to break out of the children of God. Where is the glory of God? It's where the kingdom of God is. And Jesus said, the kingdom is within you. So as we begin to come into this identity and when we've got to believe, friend, I'm telling you, cast down condemnation, cast down shame, and believe that the blood of Jesus is more powerful than anything that you have ever done wrong. If you truly repent and get your heart right with God, God does not remember anything that you've done. And this is necessary for you to release the glory of God that is within your spirit and release it into your mind, into your heart, into your flesh, and into your surroundings around you. This is how the glory of God is going to fill the earth. All right, verse 2. So verse 2 says, all right, because of everything that I have just talked about in verse 1, here's verse 2. Behold. What does it mean to behold? It means to lock your eyes on this. Do not turn away. I want you to look at what I'm about to say. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. All right. So two times in this verse, the word darkness is mentioned, but it's a different Hebrew word each time that it's mentioned. The first time it is mentioned, it is the Hebrew word kosek, which means misery, misery will cover the earth. Destruction, death, ignorance, and sorrow will cover the earth. So... The Lord has shown me, I had an open vision back in 2018, I believe it was, and the Lord showed me where fear is going to go across the earth and it's going to spread across the earth. And this fear is going to overcome people that do not believe in the word of God, that do not believe in the promises of God. And he told me, he said, fear has gone forth and it, it is going to consume individuals it meaning it's going to fill their souls. It's going to fill their mind. It's going to fill their hearts. It's going to do this to individuals. Fear is going to consume marriages. It's going to consume families. It's going to consume congregations and even small communities. Friend, we are living in this time. I'm telling you. There are leaders in our world, in our nation. I'm talking about political leaders, economic leaders, military leaders. Uh, I'm talking about church leaders. In the last three to four years, their souls have been penetrated by fear. And the reason this has happened is because before COVID, they turned away from their first love. So what happened when COVID was released on the earth it swept across the earth as an army of hell, as an army of darkness, an army of fear, and COVID began to consume individuals, marriages, families, congregations, and even small communities. So even now, I see that this is very evident because the majority of leaders, whether it's pastors or it's political, it's economic, it doesn't matter. They are controlled by fear because they are consumed by fear. 
and as a result they are operating in fear and rather than making decisions based on obedience to the Holy Spirit they are allowing fear to control them and make decisions for them which is a result results in them not walking in obedience to the Holy Spirit so while I'm thinking of it I'm gonna throw this in there are two types of oil of anointing in the spirit realm the way that you get this oil of anointing is one through adoration through loving Jesus through worshiping him casting your heart upon him loving him the second way that you get this oil the other kind of oil is through obedience for example King Saul was anointed by Samuel and the Holy Spirit came upon King Saul and he was king and he began to operate in the gifts of the Spirit we know that he uh, prophesied but we also know that he feared man more than God he admitted to this Samuel told him I want you to go out near the battle but I want you to wait on me don't do anything till I get there and we know that King Saul didn't want to wait on Samuel and he sacrificed an animal unto God so that he could get God's blessing to go into battle now this wouldn't normally be a bad thing but the prophet Samuel had told King Saul I don't want you to make any decisions until I get there so when Samuel shows up he sees that King Saul has already sacrificed an animal and he asked man what's wrong with you why didn't you wait on me like I told you and King Saul admitted I fear the people more than I fear God and that dragged King Saul into disobedience and Samuel prophesied to him that day and he said the Holy Spirit is lifting off of you today the Holy Spirit is leaving you this day because of your disobedience and because you fear man more than God when COVID struck the earth fear was released across the earth and people had a decision to make am I gonna believe the word of the Lord or am I gonna believe the false prophets am I gonna believe the media and I'm not downplaying COVID I've had COVID three times actually and I, so I'm not saying that COVID didn't have an, an effect I know that people suffered loss I know that people died from it but what I'm talking about is the spiritual ramifications of COVID there was a demon assigned to the COVID virus and these demons went across the earth consuming whoever would bow to them more than the promises of God concerning um, just God's love God's healing God's promises God's covenant so I'm not saying that people that died from COVID didn't believe in the covenant of God I'm not saying that if a Christian died from COVID they went to hell that is not true what I am saying is that people began to make decisions based on COVID rather than based on what the Holy Spirit was telling them. And that includes pastors. Pastors all over this world shut down their congregations because they feared man more than they feared God. Because they thought it better for the church to be scattered than to call a solemn assembly to seek the Lord and fight against this demonic plague that was coming across the earth. And Isaiah prophesied it in Isaiah 60 verse 2. Behold darkness, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, and sorrow will cover the earth. And friend, if you bowed your knee to that demon during COVID and you have not repented of that, that fear, that demon is still controlling you today. It's controlling your thoughts, your emotions, your relationships. It's controlling your perception of God and your obedience to the Holy Spirit. The way that you get rid of this spirit is by repenting, for giving into it let the blood of Jesus wash you and then you need to be filled with the perfect mature overflowing love of God that cast out all fear so the darkness shall cover the earth this was fear and now look at this and gross darkness the people the word gross there means heaviness it means weight gross here is the opposite of the word glory glory means the weight of God the authority of God 
when God walks in, you recognize that there is a higher power that has come into your presence and you are humbled by it. The word gross here means there is a stronger authoritative power. So the darkness that covers the earth is the power of hell. The gross darkness that comes upon the people is the authority of hell. That word darkness, the second darkness, gross darkness, is the Hebrew word erephel, and it means heavy, it means thick, it means a dark cloud. This is the authority of hell that is now coming on the earth. I'm bringing this up because what happened in Israel on October 7th, 2023, is a prophetic parallel of what's coming on the church and upon the earth, upon the nations. Here's the thing about October 7th, 2023. On the Hebrew calendar, it was the month of Tishri and it was the 22nd day. Every year on the Hebrew calendar, Tishri 22 is the eighth day of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. I say this because it was the morning of the eighth day that the Palestinian Hamas terrorists attacked Israel. It was on the eighth day of Sukkot. It was on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So what is the big deal about that? Because this is what the Lord is saying. One of the best ways you can understand Scripture is by Scripture itself. John 7, John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39 tells of this same day on the calendar, Tishri 22, in the time of Jesus's ministry. It was considered the, so John 7, verse 37 through 39, it says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, now this he said about the Spirit, with a capital S, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus stood up on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you go back and you read in Deuteronomy, when God spoke to Moses about the Feast of Tabernacles, he said, this feast is to last for seven days. But every year it happens, it just so happens that the seventh day lands on a Friday, which at sundown on Friday begins the Sabbath for the Jews, which means from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday is the Sabbath, which means when the Sabbath falls on the end of a feast, that it is added onto the days of that feast. So the Feast of Tabernacles technically is only seven days, but it always falls where the Sabbath day, sundown Friday, uh, falls on, that, on the end of that seventh day and becomes the eighth day. So John, when he's writing his letter, he refers to the eighth day as the last day of the feast, and he considers it the great day. Now, Jesus had been there at the feast for many days, and it was on the fourth day that he stood up and began to teach in the temple. So we know a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. When Jesus stood up on the fourth day, that was a parallel of his birth coming at the end of 4,000 years since creation, and he began to teach in the temple. But then it was on the eighth day. So what is the eighth day? The eighth day is the promise of eternity. It's the millennial reign. It's the place where all opposition to Jesus is cast down and his people live with him for a thousand years. And um, he's speaking on this eighth day and he says, look, here's what I'm emphasizing on this eighth day. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. All right, so what does all this have to do? What does John chapter 7 have to do with Tishri 22 and October 7th? Because this is what the Lord is saying. That in late winter, early spring of 2020, fear was released upon the earth and we called it COVID. 
and there was reason to fear the virus that was going across the earth and, and killing so many people. But there's a difference between a thought of fear, an emotion of fear, and a spirit of fear. Anyone who says they do not fear, they are ignorant. There are things on this earth and in our lives that can cause our minds to fear. That is not a sin unless you allow that fear in your mind to control your thoughts rather than you having the mind of Christ. Fear can be an emotion. That is not a sin. But when that fear is overriding your heart and your emotions more than the perfect love of God, it has just become sin. And if you give your mind and your heart to the thoughts and emotions of fear, what you're doing is making a place for the devil. You're making a place for demons to come and rest on you, demons of fear. And this has happened again all over the earth. The majority of church leaders right now in America are being controlled by fear. And, and I'm going to prove that in just a minute. What happened on October 7th, 2023, was there began a release of gross darkness known as terror that is about to sweep across the nations. And here's the, here's the biggest problem with that. Those who have given their minds and hearts to fear are now going to be overwhelmed by terror. What is greater than fear? It is terror. What is greater than darkness? It is gross darkness. So the darkness that came across the earth and swept across the earth when COVID was introduced is now going to give way to gross darkness, authoritative darkness, and terror to come upon the people. All right. So let me say this. There is a prophetic parallel rule in the scripture that what happens to Israel parallels what's going to happen in the nations. And what happens in Jerusalem is, gonna, is parallel of what's going to come on the church. We have seen that the nation of Israel has been attacked by terror. This is a prophetic parallel showing us that terror is about to sweep the nations of the earth. So I was in prayer and I was asking the Lord, Lord, what's going to happen to Jerusalem at this time? And he told me at this time, Jerusalem will not be struck. Jerusalem will not be touched by terror. So there is a period of grace and defense that God has put around Jerusalem at this time and at this moment. And it is also a parallel of the hedge of protection, <coughs> excuse me, that God is putting upon his church to protect his church from being overwhelmed by terror. This will not always be the case. There will come a day when Jerusalem will be attacked and they will suffer loss. They will not be wiped out, but they will suffer loss. So I'm bringing all this up. Let me throw this in and then I'm going to move on. When, when a Muslim butcher butchers an animal for consumption to be cooked for dinner, if they want steaks for dinner, the Muslim butcher has to kill a cow. When an animal is butchered in Islam, there are three uh, things that are present. Number one is the animal that is being butchered. Number two is the butcher, the one who holds the knife. Number three is a Muslim cleric. When an animal is being butchered by a Muslim butcher, he faces that animal towards Mecca and the present Muslim cleric then recites in Arabic, Bismillah Allahu Akbar, which means in English, in the name of Allah, our God is greater. So what they're doing is they are dedicating that animal to Allah. Allah is a false god. Allah is a demon. It is the god of the Muslim religion. And we know that this is not God Jehovah. This is not God Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim, Yeshua, the Holy Spirit. This is a false god. 
in the book of Acts, the Gentiles began getting saved and the leadership of the, of the church, which were Jews, met together and said, hey, all these Gentiles are getting saved. What should we require them from the law of Moses to obey? And they debated this and they came to this conclusion. Pretty much do not uh, drink blood, do not eat an animal that has been strangled and cease from fornication. Do not eat an animal that has been sacrificed to a false god. This was what they told the early church. Look, if you're going to experience the peace of God and his presence, you have to not eat meats that are sacrificed to idols. Right now, there is a growing sector in the restaurant and grocery industry of halal meats. What are halal meats? These are animals that have been butchered by a Muslim, cler by a Muslim butcher and blessed by a Muslim cleric and that animal was dedicated to Allah, a false god, before it was butchered and that blood was shed. So I'm bringing this up to say this, the shedding of blood brings power. The shedding of blood, innocent blood, that is sacrificed to demons strengthens demons. All right? You, you see there are witches that are in the earth. Here we are in October 2023, Halloween's coming up all over the world. Witches are going to gather together and they're going to sacrifice animals. Why are they doing that? Because they are offering the blood of that animal to the demons that they worship and that they work with. And that blood gives strength, power, and authority to those demons. All right, it works in the darkness the same way it works with us. We have a sacrifice, God's lamb, who shed his blood for us to strengthen us, God's people, and to allow his Holy Spirit to rest upon us, wash us free of our sins, and assign heaven's blessings, heaven's resources to us through the blood of the lamb. This works in the opposite in the darkness. Every time an animal is sacrificed to a false god, to a demon, it strengthens that demon to work with the people that are making the sacrifice and with those who are consuming the meat of that sacrifice. All right, what does this have to do with October 7th, 2023, or on the Hebrew calendar, Tishri 22? The morning of October 7th, 1,700 innocent people were slaughtered by Muslim terrorists who ran through the streets of the villages of Israel shouting, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. They were shouting in the name of Allah, our God is greater, and they would begin to kill innocent people. What they were doing as they went on this terrorist rampage, they were dedicating people that were about to be slaughtered to a false god and they were sacrificing them to a false god and this has begun to strengthen the demon of terror in the earth now this happens all the time with all kinds of wars but specifically in islam they speak this blessing as they fight they speak this blessing this this prayer before they kill someone. So what they're doing is they are, are dedicating, sacrificing these people to their God and innocent blood is strengthening that demon. So here's what I'm saying, friend. Fear has swept the earth and has controlled the majority of the population, even in the church, even in the leadership of the church. And now terror is about to sweep across the nations. And terror is coming with the authority of darkness, with more authority than fear. And it is time now for the church to get their heart right and to be in right position to resist this authoritative darkness that's coming on the earth. Okay, so how is this going to happen? <laughs> how does the church avoid being overcome by gross darkness and by terror? So the Lord gave me a dream. Um, two and a half, three weeks have gone by since October 7th, since the Palestinians attacked Israel. And I 
um, have not heard from the Lord concerning these things, uh, what's going on in the, in the realm of the Spirit. So I have not spoken on these things. But um, on the night of October 23rd, I had a dream. And in this dream, I was in a very well-known charismatic church. This church um, thrives on the prophetic. And in this dream, I was on the stage of this church and the service had just come to an end. And on this stage was a, a table that like you would see in a doctor's office. When you go in a doctor's office and they ask you to lay down on the table so they can examine you. It was not a hospital bed. It was a hospital table where you are examined. I'm, I'm sitting on this table on the stage of this church, this congregation, and the service had just ended and the woman who had preached that service came over to me and she began to ask me about my heart for Israel. And I immediately resonated with what she was saying and I began to tell her that from the day I was born again, I was um, led in the sinner's prayer by a Messianic Jew and I went to a Bible college and attended a church for many years that was very pro-Israel. We prayed for the Jews every day. We cried out for, for Israel. So Israel has been deep in my heart since the very beginning of my salvation experience. So I knew this in the dream. So I knew that the Lord was telling me that there needs to be a reviving in your heart towards Israel. So also in the dream, I knew that since that service had, had just gone on, that a river had begun to flow right outside the building in front of the building. In the dream, I was then separated from myself and I could see myself and I, I came off of the doctor's table and I knelt on the stage and I began to groan in the spirit for Israel. I began to travail. And it was just a long, steady sound. And I did this twice. But what was interesting was each time that I groaned in the spirit, it was not my voice that, that was heard. But what it sounded like was a child's voice. And the child was singing like an opera singer. It was this beautiful sound. And what the Lord was showing me that day was that there is a place in the spirit that his people have to come to in order to gain the burden of God to begin to allow the Holy Spirit to groan within us and to bring us into travail, into the deep place of prayer to begin to intercede for ourselves, for the church, for the lost, for the nations. And when we begin to do this, what it sounds like to the Father is a beautiful choir all over the earth of young children with opera level quality voices singing out to the Lord and the Lord will respond. So when I woke up from the dream, I knew that the view towards Israel and God's burden for them was related to the body of Christ and to the spirit of Antichrist. So I'm going to close with this. When fear came upon the earth in the year 2020 through COVID and it infiltrated the church, it also brought the Antichrist spirit with it. Now it has not been fully introduced. It came in power, but not in authority. <coughs> but we are about to see the <laughs> Antichrist spirit come in authority. What does it mean, antichrist? It means anti-anointing. If there's one thing that I've noticed among the body of Christ at large in America, if you were to take a small cup and pour the identity of every congregation into their own cup, there would be tens of thousands of little cups sitting around. Take all those cups, dump them into a big pot and stir them together and then pour the mixture out into each cup, what you have is a uniformity in every cup, meaning there is very little distinction from one congregation to another. 
There is very little that is setting apart a congregation unto the Lord. We are, uh, for the most part, every congregation is preaching this powerless gospel about grace and about mercy and inner healing and God just wants to, to help you and it's, it's really powerless and it's kind of flat. Our messages have a form of godliness but they lack the power thereof. And the reason is, is because even though the gospel is being preached, even though scripture is being read, it's coming out of a heart that is filled with the abundance of fear and it's fear of man. So just as King Saul, after he disobeyed the prophet, his words had very little power and authority the same way in the church now because the leaders of the church in America have allowed their hearts to be filled with fear. They have given themselves over to fear and it has filled their heart. So even when they preach the gospel, it is coded in fear. It is coded in powerless. It is coded in disobedience and the spirit is not upon it. And there is a distinction that is coming to the church right now as leaders begin to repent for allowing fear to come into their lives, their marriage, their family, their congregation, and their community. Through repentance, the blood of Jesus is about to wash us from this false authority that we have. We have set ourselves up as kings like King Saul, but the Holy Spirit is wanting to come upon the church and raise up the throne of David in the church leaders in the last days. This will only happen as we begin to bring the legitimacy of the Holy Spirit. What do you mean legitimacy of the Holy Spirit? Because a lot of the things that people are saying are the Spirit of God, they are not. They are the thoughts of man, they are the emotions of man. Even in churches that do not believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit, they are saying that they are doing this in obedience to the Holy Spirit. And friend, what you're doing is being disobedient to the Holy Spirit and you're, you're putting his name in there so people will not question what you're doing and what you're saying. But overall, the church is powerless. It's irrelevant. We are not having an impact on the culture and our culture is consumed with fear. The church is consumed with fear and God is about to break the yoke off the church when the church allows the anointing to come upon them. I'm declaring this in the name of Jesus. Legitimacy means to be exactly as intended or presented. The Holy Spirit is about to gain legitimacy in parts of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is about to be exactly as the Father and the Son intended for Him to be, to be known, and to operate and function. The Holy Spirit is about to be presented to the church and then allow the church to release his presence and his glory throughout the earth as the church casts off fear and allows perfect love to fill their hearts. So what God is telling me now is that through this dream, he is wanting to bring the Holy Spirit back to his church, fill us with perfect love and break the yoke of fear off of us. So I'm going to end with this. In Revelation 11, verse 3 and 4, there are two witnesses in Jerusalem. These two witnesses are mentioned in the book of Zechariah, and they are known as the two olive trees. Now, in the vision of these two olive trees, there are two pipes that are inserted into these olive trees, and olive oil is running out of the trees into the pipes, and at the other end of the pipe is the lampstand. The lampstand represents the fullness of the Spirit of God. It represents the seven spirits of God, the fullness of the Spirit. The lampstand was the first item that the priest would come to in the holy place. God is looking to release the anointing upon His church, which will then feed that oil of anointing into the lampstand in our midst. Jesus warned the church in the book of Revelations, if you do not return to your first love, I will come quickly and remove the lampstand from your midst. What is the lampstand? It's the fullness of the Spirit. And let me tell you, friend, 
the resistance in the earth that is keeping the Antichrist from taking over and ruling the church right now at this moment is the Holy Spirit. If it was not for the Holy Spirit being on the earth, the Antichrist would have already taken his seat in the temple and he would be ruling the earth. The power that is resisting the Antichrist and opposing him and pushing him back and keeping him down and keeping him from gaining authority is the Holy Spirit. Where is the Holy Spirit? Inside the believers. But the believers are about to rise up. They're about to shine for their glory has come. And the Holy Spirit in his glory is about to break out of a remnant in the church. But here's what it's going to take. These two olive trees are the two witnesses that will stand in Jerusalem. At the time they are in Jerusalem, they will not be the only witnesses on the earth. They will just be known as the two major witnesses in Jerusalem. But at that time, all across the earth, there will be witnesses in all the earth. What are they witnesses of? That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh as God, and He is the Son of God, and He is the perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. This is the message that will sweep the earth, and there are a people that will know this in their minds and believe it in their hearts, and it will come to pass. So... How do we get this oil from these two olive trees? There are two flows of oil. Number one is adoration. As we begin to love Jesus, like, like Mary in the, in the book of John, she began to open the, break open the alabaster box and pour that expensive oil over his head and begin to worship him. This is the oil of adoration. It is loving Jesus first. How do I know if I'm controlled by a spirit of fear? Because I love Jesus, but I don't love him as much as myself. I don't love him as much as my family. I don't love him as much as my community, my congregation, my ministry, my title, my position, my, my money. This is the problem right now. There are leaders in the church who love Jesus, but they don't love him more than themselves. They react to fear rather than out of love for the Lord, and it is keeping them from walking in obedience. So the first olive tree is the oil of adoration, and the second olive tree is the oil of obedience. Just like King Saul, he loved himself more than the nation of Israel. How could he be a king of Israel if he loves himself more than the nation? What made David such a... Um, successful king he loved the lord more than himself he loved the lord more than israel he loved israel more than himself all right so in order for us to get this double portion of anointing upon us we have to let adoration flow from us and return to our first love and then that will empower us to release the oil of obedience that will allow us to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and the anointing will rest upon us. These are the two olive trees that feed the lampstand. God is establishing the lampstand in Jerusalem and around the earth and marking the revival that will come to the Jews. The lampstand represents the seven spirits of God, the fullness of the Spirit. So what I'm talking about, friend, is the end times this is what's going to make the difference between places of refuge and places of destruction. If you want to live in a place of refuge where God will supernaturally protect the people in that region and God will supernaturally provide for them, then the lampstand has to be established in that region. And it doesn't mean that everybody there has to be saved. It doesn't mean that everybody there has to be committed to a congregation. What it does mean is that in that region, there has to be a body of believers that are adoring Jesus, lavishing their love upon him, pouring out their oil upon his head and upon his feet, loving him more than anything else. And they are walking in obedience to the Holy Spirit because they fear God more than man. This is going to make the difference between the places of refuge and the places of destruction. So... On October 7th, 2023, gross darkness walked out of the door 
and has begun walking across the nations. A, an authoritative spirit of fear is coming with more authority than what we have seen in the past. It is known as terror. The Lord is saying, this is what's coming upon the nations. I need you to return to your first love. I need you to set the lampstand in your midst and start filling it with oil. And when you do, I will send the fire of God to ignite it. And you will begin to get a revelation of Jesus Christ that will light your path, that will light your feet, and you will gain vision and begin to see where you're going. The Lord says that this will happen before the great harvest comes to pass. There is a, a harvest that he is sending. There are sickles that he is about to pass out from heaven to all the laborers that have been crying for his return. The laborers are few and we have to begin to walk in adoration and in obedience and, and be raised up as laborers in the field of the Lord. For Jesus himself in Revelation 14 is handed a sickle and he enters into the field and starts to reap the harvest. There's a harvest that is coming to the Gentiles and the Jews. There will be one billion souls in the earth that come to the Lord in the near future, but it will only come as we return to our first love and establish the lampstand in our midst. Friends, I love you. I bless you. If you have comments or questions, please reach out to me. We are in this together. We need each other. God is wanting to do a mighty work in these last days. I love you. Thank you for downloading, tuning in, and listening.